us. Welcome to the Health Daily Show, your go-to where leaders, founders, investors share insights on growth, innovation, business building. I'm Chitra Nabat. Joining us today is Dr. Neil Patel, CIO of Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Neil, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is great. VUMC owns and operates seven hospitals in Tennessee with over six and a half billion in revenue. Share with us the scope and scale of your organization. Well, thank you. Um, Vanderbilt is the premier academic medical center in this region. We have hospitals that provide the top-notch quaternary care. As well, we serve the entire community of Middle Tennessee as the level one trauma center and the number one provider of charity care in this area. What's unique about and challenging about your patient population and these regions that you serve? Well, while we're an academic medical center and a private facility, we have had a relationship with this community where we are the go-to place for care. We have the busiest emergency department in the region. We are the only level one trauma center in the region. We have a top-notch children's hospital that is ranked uh, nationally for the 15 consecutive years. We also have a transplant program that is not only the best in the region, we are the number one heart transplant program in the world. So Vanderbilt is a place where not only do we provide exceptional clinical care, we're also a top-notch research facility. We uh, have over $500 million in NIH grants and are rising when most other places are trying to stay plateaued. And hopefully what we can do in this region is continue to push how well the care of these patients in the southeastern region are, is. We serve as a role model for the entire community. Given some of the dimensions you just talked about, transplants, some of those statistics, what are the implications for your, for your organization operationally and economics-wise? Sure. It becomes harder and harder in this day and age to care for critically ill patients, highly complex patients. As we all know, the labor shortage is affecting every health system across the board. And we now have to train and quickly put onto the front lines individuals that don't have those years and years of experience that the complexity of these patients require. So my team, along with partnerships with our clinical and operational leaders, are looked upon how we can support that with technology to help provide the right level of support for good judgment and good decision making by individuals who are working extremely hard and are under incredible production pressures. So talk a little bit more about where technology is a significant lever for you, because based on what you just talked about, especially with transplants, those are going to be high cost of care services, uh, availability in terms of patients being able to get in. So there's a lot there to balance in terms of cost, margin, moving to more affordability. Where is technology a lever? How do you manage these pieces? Sure. I think first and foremost, we're patient-centered. We know that our patients are not only from our local environment, but they come from all uh, states surrounding us and further beyond for the uh, level of care that our incredible specialists provide. So one of the investments that Vanderbilt made long before commercial EHRs was in the development of a patient portal. Five years ago, we converted to the Epic platform and we converted to the patient uh, portal at that time. We already had close to a half a million users. Within five years, we're now up to a million users of our patient portal. And that level of engagement where patients can not only follow their own health care, but communicate with our providers, see their clinical content directly, share their clinical data with their significant others, as well as their delegates who are involved in their care, is one of the ways that Vanderbilt is trying to make sure that we meet the patient where they are. And technology is a great enabler of that concept. Neil, that sounds a little uh, too good to be true because there's a lot of providers out there who have homegrown patient portals, patient engagement portals. And at the same time, there are a lot of startups out there, many at this conference at Vive, hundreds, thousands that are working on quote unquote, digital front door, digital back door, patient engagement, patient intelligence portals. Bring to life the secret sauce, if you will, and the reality of, of how yours is effective and actually works. Well, it works at certain things. And there are still gaps that we're trying to shore up with, with our digital uh, health journey. So we are very good in terms of handling the clinical data side of it because the Epic platform provides that. We uh, also have significant engagement because we have the relationships between our clinics, our hospital, our uh, procedural areas that are all on the same platform. 
because we are able to be on a single platform, the patient does see a seamless experience. We are reinventing our uh, uh, scheduling for patients because we know that the way we scheduled patients in the past as an academic medical center was very, very um, asynchronous at times or uh, disjointed when everybody had to wait for a phone call from the scheduling center. So we have a advanced scheduling project that is redefining all of the decision trees within our platform so that 98% of a patient's engagement with either a human at a call center for a complex appointment or directly onto our platform ends in an appointment, not, this, not another phone call. So this journey is a marathon. We have to go area by area by area to undo a lot of the technical debt and the organizational debt that we had from things that started 15, 20 years ago at, with organic growth and redefine the whole platform so that we can not only deliver a seamless experience to the patient, but also have the appropriate handoffs between service areas, especially for our most complex patients. Those who have multiple appointments in a single day, those who have to traverse from diagnostic studies to clinical appointments, and those who have to have frequent interaction with our health providers, not just while they're on site, but also from home. So hopefully they can avoid a two to three hour road trip just to make it to Nashville uh, for care delivery. When you talk about technical debt and some of those pieces, how do you then think about managing your budget between running the business versus innovating and changing the business, especially given this continuous backdrop of providers having negative to depressed margins? Sure, and I think um, the pressure is now on us more than ever. This is the right time for health technologies. Many other facets of our consumer world have already undergone that transformation. We thought this transformation is occurring in the past 10 years with meaningful use of the High Tech Act and the conversion to digital records. But that was just on the documentation side of things, not in the operational logistics of how a patient needs to navigate our system, as well as how all of the care providers on a care team all have to interact on behalf of a patient. And that's where now the difficult work is. We have to value every care provider on a care team to the utmost, not just the provider. We have to value the nurse and make sure their work is optimized, their engagement with the technology is fruitful and seamless. We have to value the radiology tech, the laboratory tech, the surgical tech. All of these individuals have to have a much more refined choreography. And if you want an analogy, look to our world now. I would bet that 90% of the individuals at this conference have used either Lyft or Uber to traverse somewhere in this city. That was un unimaginable 10 years ago to think that we were gonna hail a cab in Nashville and get somewhere. And now it's just a natural part of our workflow as busy individuals that get about a city. How is the Uber driver or a Lyft driver capable of performing their job almost seamlessly, it's because it's underpinned by a platform that allows them to operate with grace and efficiency despite the lack of a 20 year experience as a taxi cab driver. We have to promote our technologies to allow individuals on the care team to operate with that level of seamlessness so that the level of trust that we place on getting to the right place at the right time when we touch an app is there for all care providers. Share with us some examples where you're innovating at scale. Bring it to life for us. Well, certain areas that we're innovating, and I think it's a key distinction to separate invention from innovation. A lot of these startups are trying to invent things for a gap they see, and I think their intention is absolutely spot on. Innovating, in my opinion, is leveraging things that you know in disparate areas and putting them together in a way that hasn't been thought of before and that can create a more seamless or a more value uh, proposition for the user or a health system like ours. So we used to be in the inventing game. We had our own homegrown EMR, but we also realized that to scale and to serve the needs uh, of not just our patients and our workforce, but also to meet the demands of the payer, of payers, the regulators, 
and also just everything that we are asked to do in terms of data interoperability, we have to now play within the confines of our major frameworks. For us, our EMR is Epic. That is going to be the platform against which everything else has to operate. So when we're innovating, we're partnering with our major partners and then bringing in either homegrown solutions or maybe solutions that are right here on the floor around us to see how they can interact. And to the end user, our users, the patient or the care provider should not see a change or feel like they're having to jump from this workflow to that workflow. So innovation in my area is really how can these new workflows reduce the workload, improve the cognitive ability of people to make good judgment and make good decisions, and reduce the overall friction in the system. And those things that can happen and integrate the best are the ones that we're gonna really try to work with. So going a bit further, some more examples then of where are you looking to partner with startups? You mentioned it, we're here surrounded at the Vive Conference by thousands of uh, founders, thousands of startups. Yes. So where are you specifically looking to partner and, and what's the criteria that they have sure. to fulfill? Well, we try to look at um, what's available and who has scale. We can't be on the bleeding edge of let's start a bunch of things and have seven to eight fail and we have two winners. Our margins as an academic medical center do not allow for that. We don't have a VC arm that's allowed to innovate in that space. So what I'm gonna look for is startups who have a track record of already having a little bit of success in places where I can phone a friend and say, are these guys for real? Are these individuals have a product that they can support? Can it withstand the security scrutinies in this world of cybersecurity challenges as we move forward? So who will vouch for them then do they have a vision of their product, of how they see it within the entire health IT ecosystem? Not just my app is the best and everybody will just download my app and everything will be just wonderful. Those are where people get a little bit too enthralled with their shiny baby and we tend to wait for others to lead. Neil, I wanna get your perspective on leadership. In life, career, business, there are rules, codes, norms on how things are done. Where have you been a code breaker and how did you do it? Well, I think it's much better to be lucky than good in many ways. Um, I was a physician who started working with health IT technology in the mid 90s with uh, computerized physician order entry, mainly because I was a lazy resident and wanted to say, hey, I think this tool can get me out on time. And I was also willing to put in the sweat equity of showing up to the meetings to explain why something wouldn't work. And fortunately, I was in an environment where people were willing to listen as well. So it was this ability to not just be the negative voice because many people initially viewed me as the negative voice, but also when they asked why something may not be to my liking, I was able to explain it's not about my liking, it's about at least insight that I have that at three in the morning in an intensive care unit, will my team be able to function while going through the pain that you may be, that I perceive you're putting me through? Or will whatever is being deployed actually help me deliver better care, help my team members be more efficient and have data in a more timely fashion? So I think the code breaker or why I've been fortunate is really building good relationships and partnerships across the aisle, from the clinical aisle to the IT world, then as a partner with IT to the operational world, and to be willing to go into places that a lot, not a lot of clinicians delve into, going and sitting down with medical coders to understand their world and what they're looking for out of the providers, going and sitting with the schedulers to determine what is it that makes scheduling so difficult and maybe we can look at it as a system. So lucky that people were willing to listen and hopefully a little bit of good and able that I was able to explain the why behind some of my opinions. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.